If I'm dying, leave the balcony open. The child is eating an orange. From my balcony, I see him. The reaper is ripping the barley. From my balcony, I hear him. If I'm dying, leave the balcony open. Good morning to everyone, this is the Spanish Civil War. In this channel, and for the next three years, we will follow week by week the Spanish Civil War, its battles and the Holocaust that it provoked. What a death means among all of this bloodshed. The death of a man that, like others, was dedicated to his people and had a clear vision of what justice was, of what art and poetry were meant to be. A man whose pen was able to send messages from his heart to our souls. The 18th of August, 1936, Federico García Lorca was killed. One of the murders, Tres Castro, allegedly boasted the following day. We just killed Federico García Lorca. I put two bullets in his arts for being a queer. With Lorca, two anarchists and the primary school teacher were also killed. But they are not the only ones dying this week, as in Madrid, another that happens that I would like to talk about. The one of General López Ochoa, the butcher of Asturias. He was so. Ochoa was the man in charge of dealing with the Asturias uprising in 1934. When the Popular Front took power this year, he was judged and imprisoned. This week, some militiamen took him from the hospital where he was recovering from an intervention, killed him and beheaded him. Ochoa was not involved in the coup, and during the Asturias repression he ordered the shootings of soldiers that were committing atrocities against the workers, in fact, that led Yahweh to threaten him with a gun. Some consider his figure to have been the key of the negotiations that led to the Starian's rebel surrender. But that didn't matter. In the battlefield, after the fall of Badajoz, the army of Africa will now march towards Madrid. The 20th, it gets in motion again. The Republicans had prepared their defensives around Guadalupe, where the terrain is favorable to them. But the African army continues its advance, slow, but secure. Even this week, a section of a census column is bombed by the Spanish squadron of Malro. When we've said that the fall of the Badajoz was not a strategic value is because Portugal had already aligned with the rebels. Well, the 18th of August, 400 people that managed to escape from Badajoz area to Portugal are sent back by Portuguese authorities to Badajoz. 300 of them will be killed. Portugal authorities allowed also the crossing of phalangist squads in order to hunt down people in Portuguese territory. As the rebel army goes north, a republican army under General Miaja is following the obvious route towards Madrid, but towards south, and will try to retake Cordova. They secure the villages in the north of the city at the beginning of this week, and the 20th, after failing to negotiate a surrender, they decided to take the city by force. As the attack commenced, the rebels were joined by the reinforcements of General Varela that had been campaigning in order to open a road between Granada and the other rebel territory. The most powerful Republican section was also hammered by bombers, so by the 21st, Miaja called off the attack. Even if sporadic fighting continued the next day, with the failure of taking Cordoba and Granada linked to the rebel side, the fate of Malaga was hanging on a rope. In the north, the troops that were approaching Donostia from the south continued their advance, but they met serious resistance from the Republicans in the Iron sector. Berregui continues to put pressure on the defenders and prepares itself to storm the city. Also in the north, but on the other side, the siege of Gijón ends. The militias finally overwhelm the rebel defenders at the Simancas barracks, which asked 
the cruiser Almirante Cervera to fire upon them. The loss of Gijón meant that now the rebels had no more haste to reach the city and can concentrate their efforts in Oviedo, that is still under siege and being bombed almost continuously. So, the Galician column from the coast that diverged last week continued their advance to the south as the column of Pita continued towards north, even if slowed by the Republican resistance. Last week, we left a huge Republican army in the shores of Mallorca. This week, they will consolidate the beach, or, quoting as Churchill from nine years later, I had hoped we were hurling a wildcat into the shore, but all we got was a stranded whale. Yes, the worst Churchill imitation ever. But the Republican troops are not advancing, thus giving time to the rebels to reinforce themselves. This week, something that we have already seen before happens, but in a more resounding way. As again, and again, civilians are being bombed. In Malaga, 65 right-wing prisoners are shot after a bombing that causes 30 deaths. 25% of the people killed in Malaga during the Red Terror were killed after bombing raids. In the north, the rebel fleet composed by the battleship España, the light cruiser Almirante Cervera and the destroyer Velasco starts shelling Donosti. But the worst episode derived from a bombing happened in the capital. After a rebel air raid against Madrid, the common prisoners of the Modelo prison in the capital muddied it and asked for their freedom, threatening the authorities with the death of the political prisoners. Simultaneously, a fire broke out the people believe it was provoked by the political prisoners in order to escape, and an horrendous massacre followed. Thirty men were killed, among the deaths the mentor of Azaña and former president of the Congress of Deputies, Melquiades Álvarez, and the cousin of Primo de Rivera. That meant a significant blow to the Republic, its international image utterly damaged, as the newspapers of the world echoed the atrocity. Negrin tried in vain to avoid the killings. Prieto, seeing the scene, will say the brutality of what has happened here means quite simply that we've lost the war. Azania, in words of Cipriano Rivas Cherif, was shocked and horrified, even considering to resign. And the British Church Affairs that went to the Minister of Foreign Affairs, threatening him with the evacuation of all the embassies, found the Spanish minister on the verge of tears confessing that the government was utterly impotent. From now on, as the army of Africa approaches the capital, the bombings of Madrid and his surroundings will become frequent. One neighborhood will be spurred, not a single bomb dropped, the neighborhood of Salamanca, where the upper classes used and used to live. The 22nd, also something very relevant happened. Franco, through his personal airplane, managed to send a message to the troops of the Alcázar that are still under siege in Toledo. The fortress has become, for the Republicans, either a symbol and a nightmare. Its walls are resisting whatever they are throwing at them, and the assaults they are carrying out, and will continue to carry out, are repelled one after another. Last Sunday, the Republican forces besieging the fortress started to dig mines, in order to blow it. With this message sent by Franco, the general starts to show his determination, maybe, to relieve the fortress. This fortress has become a symbol also for the rebels, even more than for the Republic. The determination of Franco will be fundamental either when the struggle for power in the rebel side has to be fixed and for the coming battle of Madrid. Also. Consolidating his position this week, Franco manages to send to Mola ammunition and machine guns through Johannes Bernard, that allegedly said to the director he had not to thank Germany, but Franco for the supplies. About the German intervention. Back on the 31st of July, a company was created by Johannes Bernard in Tetuan, Hisma, that was tasked to coordinate the arrival of German material to the rebels. In October, Spoiler alert, another company will be created as the German counterpart of FISMA, the ROWAC, Raw Materials and Goods Purchasing Company. 
German participation in the war was to be paid with exports and mining concessions, managed by these two companies. At the beginning, if the rebels could count with the fortune of people like Marc or Cambo, among others, the German help was, as the Italian, credited. Spain will continue with repayment and exportations to the Reich through the Second World War. With Italy, they agreed that the Spanish debt through the war ascended up to 7,000 millions of liras. The Italians will set the Spanish payment to 5,000 million. Another important credited help that arrived into rebel hands was in form of oil. Texaco's president, Thorkil Ryber, was a fascist sympathizer and provided the rebels with 1,800,060 tons of oil under credit during the whole war. We didn't talk about the clergy this week. The 23rd, the Bishop of Pamplona allegedly defined in a procession the war as a crusade. This image will become recurrent in the nationalistic narrative. During the procession, 52 detainees were confessed and shot. Just one of them escaped. In Cantalpino, Salamanca, 23 people will be killed and some women raped. We have to remember that even in the zones that easily fell under the control of the rebels, a systematic repression was taking place, in particular in the zones where the Popular Front obtained representation. The main objectives of this repression were the members of the Popular Front and trade unions. On the other hand, or side, the 20th of August, 73 priests were shot in Lleida. By the end of October, the anarchist militias would have killed up to 250 priests in the city. That's half of the killings in Lleida, meanwhile the city was under Republican hands. So, to end the week, we'll talk about another death, as if death is something unusual during this war. We talked weeks ago about the first phases of the siege of the Alcázar, and the famous and infamous call. Today we took a look to the Alcázar again, but we cannot close the episode without saying that this week, the 23rd, one month after the famous and infamous call, the son of Moscardo, the defender of the Alcázar, was killed in one of the infamous Sacas. The Sacas, as we've seen, were something common during the Civil War, in both of the territories. Some political prisoners held in prison were pulled out of the jail and shot. In the Republican side, in most of the cases, it was as a reprisal from a bombardment. As we saw in Malaga, the particularity of this saga, beyond the death of Moscardo's son and the fact that some sources even say that he did not get along with his father, was that the bombardment was made by Republican planes that missed their targets. We've been one month with you. If you missed our first episode, you'll find the link here. We'd like to be able to share with you better content. For the next episode, we've got a new map design. But we need your help in order to make it possible. So please, share. And if possible, help us through our Pantheon channel or we've also opened a coffee account. You will see the link in the description, just in case you want to offer us a coffee. So thanks. Please, don't forget to like the video and subscribe us. If you enjoyed it, share it. We have to bring light to the history of Spain. If you can take it to school also, do it. If you are able to support us in our Patreon channel, this could also be great. Thanks for your attention, goodbye and salute.